Second Timothy chapter 2. Before we look at our verses, I just want to say something. That when you see men and women that seems to be given to a life of prayer or Bible study, as if it comes easy to them, as if they were given some special gift from God on the day of their conversion. And now it's not a struggle for them to go and read the Word. It's not a struggle to go and pray. You can rest assured that for them, as much as for anyone else, it's not easy. I believe it to be a struggle. It's a fight. They weren't given any special gift. And you know what that tells me? I have absolutely no excuse. No excuse not to go and read the Word, not to go and pray, and to make these things a habit throughout my Christian life. And as Brother Wenzel said this morning, not just for the sake of it being a habit, but for my own good. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus is saying here that men ought not to just live by eating. It's to live by and according to the word of God. We read also in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. What that verse is saying is that, how do you grow as a Christian? You grow by being in the Word of God. That's how we grow. And as far as I know, and I may be completely wrong on this, but many of us sitting here are not newborn babes. We are five, six plus years into the faith. Others even longer. 10, 15 years. And others still longer than that. And if I ask anyone that has been in the Christian faith for maybe 20 years or so, it's still not easy to read the Bible, to, to pray. It's still a struggle. It's, st it's still a fight. And I've heard some men say, and I've also read in books, that the more you grow as a Christian, the more you grow in the Word, in your prayer life, the more you see God for who He is, His glory, His holiness, His majesty, and even the love He has for you, <laughs> you'll end up like an Isaiah. Now before we get there, sorry. Um, you will, as you see God for who He is, you will see more of your sin and your need before Him. It's moving into the light where God is. God is light. That's First John chapter 1. John Yates gave the example. He said that when you clean your house, you know, when you sweep and mop and dust and do everything else, and then you can look back with a smile on everything you've done. And then you can say, I did well. But then all of a sudden, a beam of sunlight comes through the window or the door. And what do you see? All that dust floating there. And it occurs to you that it's not just there, but it's maybe all over the room. In the same way, God's light shows us our sin. Not for us to see that sin and then remain the same in that sin, but to confess, repent of, and then forsake that sin. And so that's how we grow into closer fellowship with God. More light comes through His Spirit and through His Word. Shows us our sin. We see that sin. We confess that sin. And so we draw even closer to God. More light comes and so the process continues. Do you see? And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that the more you see God for who He is, you will be an Isaiah in his vision of the Lord. What did he say? He said, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of, the Lord of hosts. You are cried like Peter in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus said, Cast down your nets. What did Peter say? We, we, we worked all night and have taken nothing. But at your word, I let down the net. They caught so much fish, the net broke. And then they had to call over for help. Another ship came. They filled both ships with fish that they began to sink. In verse 8 of Luke chapter 5, it says, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When he saw that what Jesus was saying is, is, is true, he couldn't help but saying, Depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. It's, it's, it's almost as if it's wrong for you to be in my presence because of who I am. 
I heard of a story of a man and his wife in Romania. And his wife was teaching a group of girls. One day the girls came up to her, they said, we don't want to hear what you have to say to us anymore. She said, why? They said, because you keep on telling us the same thing, to read the word and to pray. She said, yes, because it really is that simple. Read the word, pray, read the word and pray. Let's say all of you that are employed here tonight, and I'm sure there must be days where you don't feel like going to work. You just don't feel like it. And then one morning you wake up, it's cold and raining, and you're like, I just don't feel like going to work. And so you don't go. Later on your boss calls you up and says, why aren't you at work? You're an honest man and you say, I don't feel like it, boss. With frustration, your boss is gracious and says, okay, be sure to be at work tomorrow or you're fired. Tomorrow comes, you do the same thing. You don't feel like going to work and so you don't go. What's going to happen? You won't have a job anymore. I can honestly say that there are days where I don't feel like reading my Bible, where I don't feel like praying. I read a book on prayer and in that book the author said, prayer is an easy thing, but it's a hard thing. Just think about it for a second. Prayer is an easy thing, but it's a hard thing. It's an easy thing. Why is it easy? Well, because you're not, you know, single-handedly lifting a double-story house or a truck. It's get down on your knees and speak to God, putting all your cares before Him, for He cares for you as we read. But also not just your own cares, but so many other, so many other things. There are so many things to pray for. So many things. But, um, Sorry, it's, um, but then again, it's not, it's not, um, but then again, why is, it, why is it a hard thing? You say it's an easy thing, but it's a hard thing. It's not like speaking to someone and standing right in front of you. You know, you, you speak to them and you can see them, you know that they're listening because they're responding. Speak to someone you can't see. You don't even know if he's listening. And you don't even feel his presence many times. But that's where faith comes in. <laughs> How do you know that God is listening when you pray? Because he doesn't speak to you with a voice from heaven or in a vision or in a dream or any other thing like that. The only assurance you have that God is listening is his word. What he says in his word, that's the only assurance you and I have. Got a little bit lost here, I'm sorry. It's, um, it's trust that when God says, I hear you, or I'm with you, He's there. When He says, I hear your prayers, it's believing that what God says in His Word is true. But you see, if I went about my days based upon how I felt, upon my feelings, I can, I can tell you that I would read my Bible very little. I would pray very, very little. It is a struggle and it's a fight. But may God help us because we need help. We need help. I know that I need help. Now, let's look at our verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, uh, in verse 15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want a title for the me oh, before we before we get there, let's pray. Sorry, I'm messing this up completely. If you look in if if you look in Second Timothy chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen, it says, "All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works." Let's pray. Dear Lord, I please ask and pray that you may be with us this evening. Be with me as I preach, Lord. I please pray that you may help me not to be speaking my own mind and my own words here, Lord, but that I may speak your word, Lord, 
and what you said in your word because tonight yeah, no one needs my opinion they, they only need your word Lord and I please ask and pray Lord that you may help me and, and may we apply what we hear uh, tonight to our lives Lord and may it not just be something we hear tonight but um, may we be reminded of this constantly Lord and although we are still in the flesh and there are many things that the flesh don't, doesn't want to do Lord I please pray that you may help us Lord because we need your help and I please pray, Lord, that this that is done here tonight may be for your own and for your glory. I please ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want a title for the message, it's Why We Should Study the Bible. It may seem unnecessary to talk about reasons for studying the Bible and assume that upon getting saved, the most natural thing for a new believer to do would be to start a lifelong journey of study throughout the Bible. After all, it did bring him or her to the knowledge of salvation. But if I look at myself, and maybe even history, and if you look at yourself, it would prove quite the opposite. The truth is that many Christians know very little about the Bible. For, for many or for most, the only Bible they get is when they come to church on Sunday. But then throughout the week, the Bible sits on a, on a, on a shelf somewhere collecting dust. Brethren, as I've heard some men say, I have one finger to point at you, I have three pointing back at me. This is as much for me as it is for you today. Now, let's look at some reasons for why we should study the scriptures. We are going to have four points. Point number one, God is the author. It says here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. A man of God here is not necessarily someone who, who preaches. We are, we are all to be men of God. And what it is telling us is that Everything we need to be and what we are supposed to be is found in the scriptures. And if we are memorizing the scripture or renewing our mind in the scripture, then the scripture will teach us, reprove us, and then train us and correct us. But if you look at that first part of, of, chapter, of verse 16 in chapter 3, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We often acknowledge a whole lot of God's functions that he, that he or, or roles that he functions as we know that he is a redeemer he is um, you know he's a he's a shepherd he's, he's the creator but one that is often left out or even forgotten is his role as the author God has given us God has written a book and as we know it that book is the Bible one said and true facts I believe will be for Christians to stand before God one day and admit that although they were saved by heeding the salvation message of this book, they never took the time to read it. They never took the time to study it for themselves. Dr. Wilmington writes, he says, for no other reason, the Bible should be carefully read to allow the believer to proclaim to Christ on that day. Dear Jesus, there were many things I did not do on earth that I should have done, as well as other things I did do that I should not have done. But one thing I did, I read your book. What a wonderful thing that would be to say to Jesus, I read your book, the book that you've given, I spent time reading it and studying it. The things that are written in this book, I believe, are there for our own good. There, there are warnings, I mean dangerous things, of what happens to a man when, when he dies in his sin without Christ. That's dangerous, extremely dangerous. Uh, um, examples laid out for us of Old Testament characters who, if they followed their own ways and their own devices, they ended up ruining their lives or they died. Um, what happened when they walked in obedience to the commands of God? In the Old Testament, Israel, when God gave them commandments and they followed in obedience to the commandments of God, there was blessing. 
But if they walked in disobedience to the commands of God, cursing was upon them. It's to walk after sin and die, or it's to walk after God and live. There are things in the New Testament of how we ought to live as Christians, of what God expects of us. How a man who is blinded by the cares of this world, walking in darkness, how his life can be transformed completely. He can have eternal life. It's all in this book. Let's move on to our second point. We are commanded to read the Bible. Joshua 1 verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We see in our verse here of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In Matthew 4, verse 4, it says, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It really does help to have a you know, Bible reading schedule or a Bible reading plan. And even as Brother Wenzel said this morning, it's not just to tick a box. It really helps to, to read a verse or a chapter, or three chapters a day, to pray. The thing is, you have to cultivate discipline. You have to create it. It's something, it's a decision that you have to make for yourself, for your own good. Now, when we talk about food, when we talk about eating physical food, can you say, okay, well, I'm not going to eat for the whole week. I'm going to save up all my meals that my mom cooks and put them away until I get to Sunday. And I'm sure that the young people, the very young people, yeah, even the boys, they wouldn't even think about doing something like that. Not even, not even the big people, I'm sure. I know I wouldn't do it. I mean, what a dumb idea that would be to put away all your food and then get to Sunday and eat it all then. You wouldn't even be able to eat it. But, but even if you did, what would happen? It, it obviously wouldn't go very well for you. We eat daily. Why do we eat daily? Because we are supplied with the nutrients. We need to live and be healthy. We get the energy to go about our daily tasks, to go to work, to go to school, to even get up and read your Bible, to pray, to do all these things. When we skip a meal, we often feel weak or tired and even grumpy. Um, and if we keep missing meals, it may even get worse, do you see? And likewise, when we eat spiritual food, we are supplied to live our Christian life. But when we are away from God's word for a while, we become spiritually weak. We become more defenseless against temptation, doubts, and all sorts of other things, or spiritual attacks that, that come our way. Do you see? It is very important that we are supplied by reading and feeding on God's Word. Not just one day a week, not just when you come to church on Sunday, but, um, or even when you feel like it, because the, we are still in the flesh, and the flesh, there are many things that the flesh doesn't like to do especially when it comes to being spiritual. But every day, to read the Word, the Bible for yourself every day, to maintain a healthy and even joyful Christian life. We move on to the third point. God has chosen the Bible to accomplish His divine will. Sinners are saved through the message of the Bible. Let's read some verses. Turn, your, turn with me in your Bibles to, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 verse 13 through 17 it says, 
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom of, who, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the, with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, He men of Judea, and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Acts chapter 2 verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says, Being a born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So you see, this, the, the Bible has the words of eternal life, literally. It can give a man eternal life. But we also see that saints, those that are saved, are sanctified through the message of the Bible. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that he should abstain from fornication. Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O Lord, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And Acts chapter 20 verse 32 says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So the Bible is not just a book for men to where they can be, be saved, but also when you are saved, what then? It's to grow, for God to sanctify you, to set you apart from this world. And I've heard, I think it's John Yates, he said, God saved you out of the world, in, God saved you out of the world in order for you to go back into the world. You see, to, to be a different person, it's to be a different person. And D.R. Moody said that the Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. And I really think that is true. Because if you're not in the Bible, you end up, you know, you're going through your week, and it's just, it's almost as if the devil is attacking you now specifically. It's like temptation after temptation after temptation, and if you're not in the Word of God, you're going to end up sinning. But if you are in the Bible, it's you will be able to stand against when the devil comes and attacks you. We come to our fourth and, and last point. Our, en our enemy, the devil, knows scripture. Or at least some of it, maybe even most of it, I don't really know. In the account of Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is tempted three times by the devil. Each, each time Jesus answers with the phrase, it is written, and then uh, goes on to quote from, from, the, script, from the Bible as found in the, in the book of Deuteronomy. And you mustn't miss the fact that the, the phrase, it is written, is repeated four times um, in Matthew chapter 4, and that the fourth time it is the devil using it to quote scripture to Jesus. Let's turn there in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4. We'll begin reading from verse, uh, verse, five, verse 5 through 6. Then the devil taketh him, that's Jesus, up into the holy city, and set at him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. This is what the devil said to Jesus. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, 
lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. This is what, Je this is what the devil used to quote a scripture to Jesus. Now the question is, how did, how did he know it? How did the devil know that? Because in, in there he was quoting from Psalm 91. From, he was quoting there um, from Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. But how did he know it? Because he's not God, he's not all-knowing. The devil is not all-knowing. Obviously, he had to have sat down at one point to, you know, memorize that verse or to even study that verse. Do you see? And that's an example for us that um, we need to read God's word. Otherwise, the devil will get the most favorable, favorable position upon us. He will take the scripture, and if we don't know the scripture, he will take it out of context and make us believe something that is not really there, that is not really true. Now, to end off, we, we looked at four points this evening, and the first one was, we, um, why should we study the Bible? Because God is the author. The, the second one was, because we are commanded to read it. The third one, God has chosen the Bible to accomplish His divine will. And then, lastly, because our enemy, the devil, knows Scripture. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I please ask and pray, Lord, that <coughs> this evening this message may have been an encouragement to all of us and a challenge, Lord, that we need to um, cultivate discipline. We need to make a decision to study and to read the Bible for ourselves. It is something that we'll have to do, Lord, if we want to, to be in closer fellowship with you. If we want to have a closer walk with you, Lord, we need to be in your word. It's moving into the light where you are, Lord. And I please pray, Lord, that as we go through this week now, that you might help all of us, Lord, to, to make this decision, Lord, that you may help us to be in your word, Lord, that, that, we may, that we may pray, Lord, just not for the sake of, so that we can say we did all these things, but in order to grow as Christians, in order to be sanctified by you, in order to walk in sweeter and closer fellowship with you, Lord. And I please ask and pray, Lord, that you may now dismiss us with your love, and may we go through this week to honor and to glorify you in everything we do. Oh Lord, I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.